There you go. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Movement Longevity Show. It's Thursday, noon, Eastern time, and Dr. B and I are here. Doc, how are you doing? I am very excited for the warm weather. The crocuses are popping up and the daffodils, and uh, it's uh, time to get ready to running. And speaking of running, look who's just run onto our show there here. There she is. <laughs> Hi, Lisa. How are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you? Good. Excited to, excited to see you and have you join us today. I'm excited to be here. I look forward to it. That's awesome. Great. The guest the guest of honor has showed up. Lisa, good to see you again. Good to see you. Although I feel like I, I see you almost every day when I'm doing all my exercises. <laughs> so sure. you might be excited to see me, but I've seen you a lot lately. <laughs> yeah, you're probably sick of me. Not this guy again. Jeez. I was watching, I was watching the video, I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday's video about dorsiflexion. Okay. Tuesday's video. I watched yes. it yesterday. And um, yeah, so I, I, I love all that. I love learning everything. <laughs> yeah, nice. it's a it's a fantastic video, isn't it, Lisa? Like, yeah. um, I, th I, I love how concise it is. And I love also how Eric sort of is very practical. You can assess where your issues are and then he gives you something to do. You know, being a surgeon, I always like to know what to do. Yeah. And yes. what am I going to do about this? So yeah. Great job, Eric. Yeah, Thank you. It's, it's awesome. I was about to do a segmental spine before I got on because my back's a bit stiff, but I, I ran out of time. <laughs> oh. Okay. Well, maybe you can walk us through it. You can just point your camera down, start to do yeah. it, walk people through, get a follow along with Lisa Bentley today. You know what I love? I mean, everything takes effort and I get that. Like I, when I tell an athlete, you know, oh, this would be a good thing to add. I, I, I can feel their weight of their shoulders go. I can't do another thing. And I get it. And I feel the same way. And I mean, really, this is my life. But um, I did when, I, when I've done the segmental spine, for example, and I said it was unbelievable, like because it, it's basically you're giving yourself your own massage because you got the foam roller there and you're, you know, wiggling around doing your little press ups and then side to side. And it was like, I had my own massage. And so as much as it's a task, it's like a three minute task where you come away feeling good. So if you can just get a habit, make it a habit. And that's what life's all about is, is finding those routines. And uh, anyway, I, I just, I'm lamenting with people who say, Oh, I can't do another thing. I get it. I totally get it. But when you do it, you'll be happy. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, there's a lot of stuff that we're going to uncover, I think, with you today. Um, <laughs> first of which, I want to just mention this to anybody who's watching now. Uh, I've recently read this. This is Lisa's book. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like a champion. I've got a copy. Dr. B's got her copy there. <laughs> I got a copy for the team, like everybody on our team. Um, before I finished it, I was like halfway through and I was like, I got to get this for everybody who Aww. we work with. Uh, so we got a copy for everybody. I got a copy for uh, my boxer that I still train, who is fight. She's got her second pro fight coming up. I was like wow. in the middle of training camp right now. And I was like, you got to get this right now. The sooner, the better, because this will help you. Um, so it's just an amazing book. And we'll have a link to it uh, where you can Thank pick you. this up. But I think everybody, whether you're an athlete or not, uh, should get this book because of, you know, the, the, the stories are, are unbelievable. Like I, that's what I got so much. That's probably the, the part of it that I liked so much was the, the journaling and the stories and the, the raw um, stories that you share. And they're just, I found them amazing and very inspiring. And honestly, I felt almost invincible for a couple of days after reading it <laughs> because of, you know, reading about your mindset and what you battled through um, made me, made the things that I was dealing with seem like, you know what I can deal with. If Lisa could deal with that, <laughs> I could deal with this, like being audited for by the the CRA. Like that's no problem. I could deal with that. You know. Aww. So thank, well, thank you so you. much for writing this book and sharing your your stories and yourself uh, with the world and everybody. You just get the book. You'll you'll thank me later. Just get it. <laughs> thank you. That's very kind. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, Doc, maybe you can intro Lisa a little bit. I know people have seen her if they've been following the show. Um, but there's a lot of new people here showing up all the time. So give your, give Lisa a quick little intro uh, before we get well, going. Um, besides being an amazing person, uh, which I think um, to me is one of the most important things in the world. She's kind, respectful, humble, 
Um, she, she's an individual that um, came to see me as a patient. And, you know, as the doctor who's supposed to be teaching their patient, I learned an awful lot from my patient, Lisa. Mm -hmm. And um, she's, an, she's an incredible athlete. She's an 11 time world Ironman champion. Um, and that in and of itself is an incredible feat, but she also suffers from a genetic condition called cystic fibrosis, which affects your cardiovascular, your, your, your lungs primarily, and your digestive system. And what I love about Lisa is her mindset that she has taken on the world and her cystic fibrosis and um, just tackled it and sort of said that, you know, I am who I am and I'm going to be the best person that I can be with what I have. And I'll never forget one time we were talking about all the training that she puts into one race. And I'm like, wow, you know, like, what if you don't get, you know, you don't win or whatever. She goes, well, Aaron, I'm going to be the best individual on that day that I can be. And so if that's number 50 or number two, and she was rarely number 50, but if it's number two, she's going to be the best number two. She's going to put her whole self and her whole heart into her race. And she does that with everything in her life. And, you know, Lisa shared with us um, some of the inspirational stories that she shares with the CF community. And, you know, it's just, um, it's remarkable, Lisa, the, the hope that you give to people. And so, mm -hmm. Um, thank you for joining us today, because I think you can give not only people who aren't injured hope, but people who suffer from injuries, running injuries, you know, training injuries, and then an illness such as CF, tremendous hope and inspiration. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And, you know, it's interesting. I did a, a talk for uh, Royal Bank a couple of weeks ago, and they asked questions afterwards. And uh, they, one of the questions, uh, they came up with really great questions. They said, how did you develop uh, the team around you? How did you develop the trust? Because I was saying to them, my message to them was that it's really important to list your assets. So when you're feeling defeated, as we all do, especially when you have an injury, uh, it's important to list all the things you have going for you. And I used to do this before every race like a race was very risky. I was completely vulnerable. I was had people watching me and this is my career and this is how I earned a living, but it was also, you know, how I drew my satisfaction as well. And so I'd list my assets before the race and they'd be things like, I'm a good problem solver. I never quit. I have never missed a workout. And one of the things was I have a great team. I have a, I have a dream team. And that was you know, Dr. Aaron, you know, I, I have a great team around me, Dr. Gallia, Steve Hill, my physiotherapist, uh, Mark Scapatici, my chiropractor, and I had this team. So in talking about this, one of the people from RBC that one of the uh, attendees said, how did you trust them? Like, how did you develop that trust? And, and I said, you know, that was the key. They explained to me, and I'm sure for people who watch this video and have been following uh, the videos week after week, you have a team and they say, okay, Lisa, stop writing for two weeks. There was always the explanation. There was always the why. There was always the how to get back at it again. And is there more to gain or to lose with that one single run that you're dying to do? And, and my dream team instilled that in me. And so that's how I trusted. So, you know, my message to them was, you know, trust the people around you, develop that, that web. And, you know, you don't want to be around people that are going to bring you down. You, there's enough of that in the world be around the people that build you up and uh, so that's how I you know chose my athlete or as a parent or in a you know professional career on who I let onto my island so to speak too <laughs> you know I'm my island and I want people to come onto my island that are going to help me um, and then also I help them it's sort of a mutual there's a mutual relationship yeah. Um, and you know, you can kick somebody off your Island for a while and then they maybe can earn their way back on, but I think your words are very true. And, and it's very important, I believe to empower people with knowledge and, and that's what you do as well. You mm -hmm. give people tools that you've used very successfully in your personal life in your career in your racing, you know, to your speaking now, um, to be successful. So hopefully we can share some tools today, Eric. What do you think? Yeah, I think um, just that one right there was something that 
from the book, The Asset List that you talked about, Lisa. I found that such a good, great idea um, for athletes, for sure. That's one thing that I highlighted for my, my athlete, the boxer who's fighting soon, um, Amanda. I, I told her, you know, build your asset list. You'll see the story about the bike seat and all the things that <laughs> happened in that race. Um, Constantly going to be juggling. There was a race at Ironman Australia where basically everything went wrong that could go wrong. And for me, that was, so the race hadn't even started yet. I'm running to the swim start, rip my race suit. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I look down, I figure, okay, the race suit will be fine. I pull the thumbtack out and I'm just telling myself, you're not going to give control to a thumbtack. So off I went to the swim, got into the swim, 3000 athletes in the ocean, the gun goes off. And I've done this hundreds of times. And in the first five minutes of a nine hour day, I get you know, elbowed in the face. My goggles fill up with water. They come off. I didn't realize it at the time, but I got a black eye. Uh, anyways, you know, I'm in the heat of the battle. Like I've got the women I want to race with right with me. And now all of a sudden I'm readjusting goggles and I'm, you know, I've lost the pack. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, of course, frustration comes over here. And I thought to myself, you know, Lisa, you can be frustrated for the theme when I raced something to focus on other than the the pain <laughs> that might be associated with racing so my theme might be gratitude uh, I believe when I was in particular early working with Erin when I was quite injured uh, I was just so grateful that she got me ready to do a race so I was as hard I'm climbing a mountain or I run you know feel dehydrated or I'm bonking I just kept thinking gratitude gratitude you want to be here this is what you want you want one more mile you want one more mountain uh, so in this particular race I can't remember what my theme was but in that moment where I've stepped on a thumbtack ripped my suit lost my goggles lost the competition I thought to myself okay I think my theme's going to be overcoming obstacles today and you know, it's really easy to say you're a champion. You're a, at this stage, eight time Ironman champion. You're the four time defending champion. It's so easy to say things like that, but sometimes, you know, you got to prove it. And a real champion can deal with adversity. That's what they do. You know, the CEO is the CEO because they can handle adversity because they can figure it out. So if I'm going to be called the champion, then I better figure it out. So I decided that this would be the obstacle race and that I was going to have to really prove that I was a champion and part of proving that I was a champion ocean and swim as hard as I could and bike as hard as I could and run as hard as I could. And where it ended me up, it ended me up, but I was going to definitely prove I deserve the title on. And there were more obstacles. I just kept saying, fantastic. Instead of going, Oh my God. And my, my water bottle, my nutrition key element of the day, I lose my nutrition the backup plan, there's always got to be a backup plan. Plan B wasn't successful. I missed the aid station with my special needs, the special next bottle. And so now I'm thinking, okay, okay, problem solved. Like I wasn't discouraged. I wasn't even frustrated a single tiny bit because my theme was overcoming obstacles, proving I deserve the title champion. And so I thought, okay, what do I need to get through this bike ride? I need sugar for energy. I need sodium for electrolytes. And I need water for hydration, sugar, salt, and water. And so I was out there. I'm problem solving it. I'm like, okay, I'll take one more salt pill per hour. I'll take one more power gel, like a little gel pack per hour. And I can get water from the aid stations. And so I'm, you know, again, I'm riding 35 kilometers an hour <laughs> racing. But I'm like, sugar, salt, water, sugar, salt, water. But it was all part of the theme, overcoming obstacles, prove that you're a champion. And got it, you know, finished the bike ride, got onto the marathon ran as hard as I could. And, you know, the icing on the cake was I got to win the race. But to be honest, I would have won the race no matter what, because I got to the finish line. And that's what it's about is doing the best you can with your deck of cards, overcoming adversity, problem solving. And, you know, that I'm so, you know, I raced a lot, but that's the race I remember, because I'm, I'm proud of it. It didn't go smoothly. And I think everyone can put themselves into that position. It's the days that don't go smoothly sometimes where you have to give that extra 10%. That's where you're really proud of yourself. So that was definitely one of those times. Yeah, that, that's, I read that story and I was just, <laughs> that is unbelievable. Um, you know, I, 
the other day I was doing some kettlebell swings and I was wearing a hoodie with strings and it was hitting me in the face every time I swung. And I actually thought of that story. It's like, I'm not going to stop the set because this little <laughs> string from my hoodie is hitting me in the face. If Lisa can go through an Iron Man, lose her, her bottle of uh, electrolytes and then figure it out as her heart rate's at, what's your average heart rate when you're running or when you're uh, biking an Ironman, maybe 150, yeah, 160? Probably about 160 when I'm yeah. on the bike, probably around 170 on the marathon. Yeah. And you're figuring oh, yeah. this stuff out <laughs> as your heart rate's at that level. Like that's to do all that stuff in the midst of that race. Like it, I just found that the whole book <laughs> amazing, but that story in particular really stuck with me. Um, yeah. So that, you know, I applied it to my little situation. <laughs> I finished my 15 reps of kettlebell swings and I was proud of that. Um, but it's, yeah, it's just amazing. Like I felt yeah. unbelievable um, and so much more in control with how things go in my response to, to how mm -hmm. things are going. Um, I did want to ask a question about the, the resilience that you have and have shown time and time again through the stories that you've shared. Is this something that you had early on or is this something that you consciously had to start developing at a certain point? It's probably a combination. Uh, I, I mean, I still believe that although my parents weren't my biggest cheerleaders with my sport, uh, they are my best coaches, even though they certainly never coached me. But it's those little lessons that you learn as a child, you know, finish finishing what you start. I mean, that's one of the key things I talk about often. Uh, but I, you know, I was taught to finish what I start to try my best. And you know, thrown into some different sports. And I was never really good at anything, uh, but I was exposed to everything. And, and I certainly was brought up in a humble home uh, in terms of, I have four brothers and sisters. We were all the same. My, my parents um, treated us all the same, even though we were very different. And I remember a stage that the teachers wanted to put move me ahead of grade or they wanted to put me in a gifted class or gifted school. And my mom and dad were said, no, uh, we want her to grow up with her peers. So, you know, it was very much a, you know, a norm for me. Uh, but I mean, I was definitely told there were things I couldn't do. Uh, my, you know, my track coach told me that I, I really wasn't an athlete. Uh, when I, when I was, so I went to him one day and said, I'm so excited. I'm so I'm an athlete. And he's like, oh, no, you're not athletic. <laughs> you try really hard, you know, basically was his message. And then even going to sports doctors to get fitted with for orthotics. Uh, yeah, I have dead flat feet. And the, you know, the doctor said, you know, you'll never be a runner. And it wasn't that I went around my life trying to prove people wrong. It wasn't that kind of anger or anything. It was just like, OK, whatever. You know, like I just going to do my thing. And um you know, that I, I just feel like I, if I wanted to do something, I did it. And I was never told that I, I was told maybe I couldn't do something, but I never really took it to heart. I just tried it and I just did it. And, you know, I did start running and it, the benefits of, of things outweighed the negative. So maybe I wasn't very good, but I really liked running cross country and track. So I did it. I liked the way I felt afterwards and I wasn't very good. But I did it. And then when I went to university, I was away from home for the first time. And I had a very strong connection to family and went to University of Waterloo. And so I thought, oh, I better join you know, a team because I need to feel that sense of family. So I joined the running team. So I guess in that sense, I was trying, I was learning resiliency. I was learning, you know, learning how to fit in in a sense. And so it's been like that, you know, at University of Waterloo, I was in math and computer science, I never touched a computer until I went to the University of Waterloo, which is basically computer heaven. And now I'm registered as a math and computer science student. And I'm crying in my first lecture, looking at the information and thinking I've never seen this in my life. And I, you know, my professor said, please, Lisa, don't quit because there's not enough women doing computer science. And so I stuck with it. So it's, it's been a theme, I, I suppose, the whole time. And, and, and then it's just carried over to, uh, to sport. Uh, you, to go to university, I need to get a scholarship. That was just the way it was. And so I worked hard. And, and that what you do in academics, you then do when you're in sport. So it's, it's been a theme the, the whole time, for sure. 
So, okay. So um, what are some things that you could recommend to people to help build their resiliency? I think what we've discussed already would help the asset list, developing mm -hmm. your asset list. So you could fall back on that and see, okay, I'm good at things or I do have things going for me. Um, what else would you teach or coach people on? I mean, I, I'm a big believer in keeping a journal, uh, mainly so that you can document the, the highlights and the less than highlights to, to really show yourself what you can do. So if you, you know, I, I remember as I wrote the book, actually, because I have, you know, 30 years of journals now, uh, looking back and, and I wrote the book when I was retired from sport. And I'm looking back at some of the workouts and going, wow, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> and, and, but if I didn't have it written down, I wouldn't have remembered that. And before a race, I would go back in my journal and I'd be reminded of the great workouts I did. And what that did was that fueled my confidence. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, I've done that. I've done that. And so there's every reason to believe that even though I'm 15 minutes down starting the marathon, there's every reason to still have hope that I can catch the people ahead of me. And that's one thing that a journal's provide, provided me with. It's also been instrumental in documenting injury and setbacks uh, to, to show me sort of the chronology of coming back or how the injury occurred. Uh, I look back sometimes now and I uh, I see, you know, right arch sore and I see that in April and then I see, oh, my baby toes sore and then this is sore. And then, you know, six months later, there's a full blown injury to that foot because it was all, it was just ch chasing me around my foot. And so now that becomes information for the future. So, okay, when, when this gets sore, if maybe you back off a bit or you focus on some strength and you're focused on mobility, you're not going to get to that six month destination of full blown injury. So I find that the journal really helps to develop that that she, that armor against possible injury. <clears throat> and it also definitely builds up the shield when I would go into a race because it would build that confidence. I remember one workout <clears throat> that I wrote in my journal. And in the morning I ran um, 30 kilometers, 35 kilometers, something crazy. And, and I was feeling tired. Okay, of course you did. <laughs> Of course, she felt tired. So I ran 35 kilometers. I was exhausted, went to sleep, got up, and then I rode for five hours afterwards. Again, I can't believe I did that, but I did. Rode for five hours, was really tired. And I, I wrote basically, I'm exhausted. I, I, I must need a huge rest. I'm not adapting. Three days later, I did a workout where I rode really hard for three hours and then I ran really hard for one hour and, and it was an amazing workout. And I remember writing below it saying, adaptation's an incredible thing. And when I look back, I see the struggle on Monday and I see the adaptation and the performance on Thursday. And again, that is powerful to show you that one workout doesn't make an athlete on either side. You know, that one single workout, which went brilliantly, doesn't mean that I'm in a smooth sail. The workout on Monday is probably the more profound one to show that when you put the work in, and when it feels like there's not the reward, you know, the, the watch doesn't tell you, oh, you're unbelievable. <laughs> you didn't go really fast. So when the feedback or the data might seem like, oh boy, you're going backwards, the reward might be a few days later. And again, that was again, great for resiliency so that a few weeks later, when I had what I might call a workout where I struggled, I could say, Hey, three weeks ago, you struggled on Monday and you, you shot, you know, you were, were really um, unbeatable on Thursday. So that helps to build the resiliency. So that information. And, and then also in my journal, I keep information that just tells how I'm doing. So Overtraining, a lot of people hear about that, isn't just from running 35K in the morning and riding five hours in the afternoon. That's a lot of training, yes. But if I went and worked full time, and if I had four kids running around the house, and I had a big presentation to do a couple of days later, the whole combination of that cycle of work, 
and a busy family, for example, that com in combination would lead to overtraining. So anyone who's aspiring to do Ironman, no, you probably don't need to do a 35K run in the morning and a five hour ride in the afternoon. In my world where that was all I was doing, it worked, but it wouldn't work if I was running a company, had four kids. <laughs> so it's important to also write what's happening in your life alongside of the training or the projects, et cetera, because that's all part of the picture. And also builds the resiliency because it can show you that you survived. You know, you survived all of that in previous times. And, and I think that's going to be really important in the next year when we come out of the pandemic, because we've all gotten very used to a very slow life right now, not without stress. It's been highly anxious life. But if you think about what your day might've looked like a year and a half ago, you know, running to catch a flight, landing, getting a rental car, going to a, you know, a conference or a presentation or an event or whatever, and you're balancing and then you might be doing phone calls and, and, and consultations and things, and you're juggling all that. That was our life a year and a half ago. And I don't think any of us have a life like that right now. And again, remembering that we could handle it back then will be important to, as we re-emerge into the landscape of, of normal life that we are resilient enough to, to handle it. You know, we can handle it. And this year has been amazing for resiliency, if you ask me, because we've all had to adapt so much. Um, we probably never thought we'd be having Christmas by Zoom or FaceTime. We probably never thought we'd be seeing our doctor by Zoom. Uh, we probably never thought that we'd be homeschooling children, our children, and being around our families 24 hours a day. But we're resilient and we did it. And we've, we've picked up the load of our lives and we've just trans, we've changed our habits and we've all survived. So that's a great lesson in resiliency right there. Yeah, that's, I think we, the journaling there is uh, something that I know Dr. B has mentioned to me a couple of times. Um, Doc, did you want to ask anything else about uh, Lisa's process about journaling or well, actually, at least I'm wondering how much, when you do it and how much time you spend doing it per day. I'd like to spend more time, but I always do it before I go to bed. So it's sort of like a summary of the day. And by then I'm sometimes a little bit tired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, um, but yeah, I usually I do it before I go to bed and I do write everything down. Uh, and, and even, you know, when we drive down to Florida and, and my husband will say, oh, do you remember where we stopped? you know, where we stopped to sleep that night. And I'm like, oh, let me just check my training journal because I have it written <laughs> right in there. And, you know, that it was a great spot to walk the dogs or do whatever there happened to be a grocery store. So yeah, I, I, I would like, I spend generally between five and 10 minutes um, keeping, um, keeping my journal up to date. So do you have a, like a specific method in your journal as far as like what you talk about. I, I tried to do some journaling and I found myself going off into the Netherlands. <laughs> and then I was like up all night thinking about all these things that I was, you know, that I shouldn't have been. And I, and, and, uh, or didn't necessarily want to be thinking about all night cause I wanted to sleep. Um, so, you know, do you, do you just basically hit the highs of what you did eating, training, how you're feeling, Maybe you could take us through that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I actually don't have it here, but it, this is my day timer, but it's generally just a day timer. So this isn't my journal, but um, like I would have like a day like this mm -hmm. and, uh, and I would just start it with how, you know, what time I woke up at and what I did. So it's interesting because we got a new puppy two years ago <clears throat> and I actually started writing down, you know, awake at 3.30. <laughs> like I was right, I wrote everything, you know, walked Hadley at 3.30. Took me 30 minutes to get out the door because she kept biting my toes and biting this and doing this. And, uh, you know, I just, you know, write down everything. And then I, at the time, so we had two dogs. So um, one was nine and one was two months. And so I take out Hadley. Then I'd get on my bike and try to get in a quick workout for like even 30 minutes. It didn't matter. And 
see how long she would stay in her crate beside my bike. And then I'd get off and take her for another walk. And, and I wrote all this down because I thought these are going to be great memories to look at. And again, I'm somebody who gets on, when I get on my bike, it's never less than an hour. It's never, you know, it's usually somewhere between 90 minutes and three hours. So now I'm basically 23 minutes on my bike, you know, <laughs> then I'm walking her again. And then somebody wakes up. Now I'm walking both of them. And, you know, the crazy things I was doing in the middle of the night, that's all in my journal. And, um, you know, things that are new, if it's something I do every day, then I don't write it down. Uh, and there's definitely some days where there's more emotion, uh, emotional information that I need to write down. Uh, so I will do that. So if there was something, um, you know, traumatic that happened that I want to write down, you know, I'll, I'll put it down, you know, like I had an argument with this person or I spoke to my mom and it wasn't a great conversation. Like I'll write all that stuff down so I can kind of look back and it's, you know, it's a great learning tool as well. I didn't get enough sleep. Um, you know, from an athletic point of view, I think it's really interesting when I look back uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I, I right now <clears throat> have a torn to be a tibial posterior tendon, uh, which is goes through the arch. And I have chosen not to fix it just to be as strong as I can with all the other parts of my foot. And, uh, but I look back to pre-diagnosis and it's like the writing was on the wall. It was on my journal, you know, right, th right foot, this right foot, that this is sore, that is sore, didn't run, skipped a run, did a water run. And it's back and forth. And it's just like incredible. And I look at it and go, this is amazing this is like candy for a doctor to read <laughs> because <laughs> it was like all it's basically you know it was um it was happening right before my eyes but I didn't pay enough attention you know I thought well yeah of course you've got flat feet well of course your your toe hurts of course this hurts of course that hurts until eventually you know that was the end of that but um and, and even in dealing with that I wrote myself a note to be honest in my journal when I got the diagnosis, uh, it, which really was basically, you know, your running days are, are, are done. And, um, you know, basically speaking, my running days were done. I kind of saw that coming because it, I wasn't bouncing back. Like I know my body well enough that if I take a couple of days off or a week off, I'm fine. And so I took that, that week off, I was not fine. I'm like, okay, this is a big deal. This is a problem. And, you know, when I researched it and reached out to the experts and my dream team and got their feedback, uh, realizing that, you know, my running days as I knew them were over, you know, I really, I wrote, I wrote in my journal and I wrote, you know, you're, you might not be able to run anymore, but there'll be something else. This is time to find a new sport. This is time to learn something new. Maybe this is the way it's supposed to be. Maybe this is happened so that now you'll take incredible pleasure in running 15 minutes with your husband, you know, whereas you guys never ran together before. Um, you know, this is where you're going to take pleasure in other things and learn new things. So uh, I, I wanted to turn it around. Like that's sort of my defense mechanism is to take that negative and try to find a positive out of it. And I basically wrote a message to myself saying, okay, it's time to recreate, you know, you're not just a runner. <laughs> You're not just an athlete. This is an opportunity to be something different. And, um, uh, but you know, I'm, I'm happy to say I can jog and I jog with my dog and that's been the new beginning and I'm happy with that. And, uh, and, and so, but that's all, you know, really was part of the journaling process. And it's so fun to look back. It's, it's almost like a picture book for me. If we, if you, in the old days when you had photo albums, it's my photo album of my journey. And uh, so I, I highly rec recommend um, writing in a journal and <clears throat> like I bring them with me everywhere. And they, I mean, they take a lot of space. <laughs> but I, can't, I do bring them, I do bring them with me everywhere. Well, I, I think it's fantastic. Um, I just want, I, I, there's a lot of neuroscience out there now that shows the importance of journaling and the act of writing physically writing, not just typing on a computer, but there's a connection between your hand and your brain. And we basically are what we think as well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that your journaling serves a number of purposes for problem solving and, 
and resetting, reframing your life, which is mm -hmm. your resilience. It's, it, it's really mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, one thing I wonder, you know, when, if you look back and you say, oh, I could see that the injury was starting at this point. And would you have advice for the athlete out there now who's doing really intensive training? And how do you determine if, oh, it's just my toe today and I'm altering something versus, okay, now I'm starting to go down the rabbit hole and I'm going to end up with a tib post tendon injury. Like, you know, something always hurts when you're training the, with the intensity mm -hmm. that you're, that you were used to training. <clears throat> so do you have any tips having, you know, looked back at your journals and your injuries uh, that you can give people to try and escape from the really serious injuries overall? Absolutely. The, I mean, I think the biggest thing is to have that non-emotional uh, person that you can share it with that's outside of, of your, um, you know, you're too, you're too attached to it. I, if I was still an elite athlete two years ago, it would never have gotten this far because I surrounded myself, as I said, with the experts. Uh, at that at that stage two years ago, I was, an, you know, an amateur athlete just doing my thing. So of course I had people I could ask, but it was like, oh come on, you know, you just take a few days off, it'll be fine. And um, and it was actually, you know, I I think part of my problem was that I know myself so well. It typically would be fine, and it was fine, and then it wasn't, <laughs> and. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> for me as a coach, I am very cautious. So when I have an athlete communicate with me that something's sore, it's a shutdown, a complete shutdown, um, <clears throat> until it's either assessed or goes away. Because in my experience, if you can shut things down for a, a two days, you can often get rid of an injury because it all starts as a niggle. It's if we don't catch it as a niggle. So as soon as something's wrong, you don't run for a few days, which at one time in my career, that was completely foreign to me. Like you have a bit of pain while well, you run through the pain. That was, that was the way it was 30 years ago uh, until again, I surrounded myself with great people. And it was like, oh, well, do you think you have more to gain or to lose by going for that run tomorrow? And I was like, yeah, more to lose. Okay, well then don't run. And so I didn't run and nine times out of 10, I could run two days later. And that was huge. So that's the first thing. And I'm, it's probably and, and the reason why as a coach, I feel like that's something that I'm, I, I'm proud of is because of the people that helped me during my career is you guys, you all taught me um, to respect those messages of pain and injury. And so it helps me, you know, I can be the unbiased person. I've been there. I know that if you take a week off running, it is not a big deal. <laughs> and I know that a week off running just means you get to ride a bike or swim or do something, water run or do another row, rowing machine. There's so many other activities. I can keep you so busy without running. So, and I've learned that from my own experience. So that's what I do with athletes. As soon, and, it's in, and timing too. So if someone has an injury in say February or even just a niggle in February and their goal race is in August, well, that's it. We close it down because we want to be running in April. There's no way you can handle taking an injury from February all the way through to August. That is just a battle. And then I've also learned that it's better to get to the start line 80% fit, but 100% healthy. And, and just to say that again, you're better to be 100% healthy and 80% fit rather than 80% healthy and 100% fit. I would take the healthy over fitness any day because you, your mind can make up that extra percent, 20%. So if, if it is... I have absolutely no problem as a coach having an athlete not run or bike, whatever's causing the injury for several weeks. And then the week of the race, you know, if possible, touch on a couple of little, um, you know, uh, activation exercises and, and they race fantastic because they're getting their healthy. And that's, you know, one of the biggest keys. So, um, uh, so what I would tell the athlete is 
listen to your body, know your body, but also confide in other people. Don't be afraid to take time off and find an alternate activity. We're lucky if you can have alternate activities. Because again, I've been at a place in my career where I've had an injury and I actually can't do the other sports either. That is the drama. <laughs> but if I have to, you know, running's typically the injury that, that sneaks up mostly. If I can't run, I can typically ride my bike or water run or row or do something else. But on those rare occasions where you can't do anything, that's the time where it's difficult. And even then we, you know, when I've been in positions like that, I'll say to myself, okay, you're going to be the best person you can be who can't do any sport for a week. Like this is the time, this is where you build that resiliency, really. Like it, this is adversity. So let's go into that week and do everything we can to come out better and healthier. So we're going to focus on health. We're going to focus on nutrition. We're going to focus on learning about how to not get injured again. So I just kind of take the, the, the injury and change it into an opportunity. And, um, but absolutely listen to your body and, uh, and, and ask other people too, but don't ask the people that are crazy that run two times a day because <laughs> they'll tell you just to keep running. <laughs> no, that's, that's awesome. And, um, I think also you use your mind so well in your book, you talk about visualization and, you know, if you can't do anything physically, you can still visualize yourself doing your activity and the brain doesn't know any different. It's really amazing. Um, and, and I think that, that uh, you've used that tool again in a, in a very powerful way. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I remember of falling off my bike and I broke my arm and I broke five ribs and I couldn't swim and I couldn't run actually because I'd broken ribs uh, I couldn't swim and I couldn't run I was racing as a professional at the time and uh, I remember just going to the my, my mirror in my bathroom and and just going through the swim stroke with the with the good arm and then gradually like as I could move my other arm and so I wasn't in the water but I was just reiterating the swim stroke in the mirror and and looking at it and, and just watching what was happening and just keeping that mental part going. And if nothing else, it just kept me busy. <laughs> it made me think I was doing something. And, you know, I, re I remember I had my appendix burst in Hawaii one year when I was racing and uh, it actually burst before the race, but I still tried to race. I didn't get to finish because it was burst. <laughs> but anyways, I had the appendix out and I couldn't exercise for six weeks which like is tragic, <laughs> you know, like I was like, what? <laughs> like, and I'm like researching everything. I was just looking for someone to tell me the doctor, the surgeon was wrong. And they're like, nope. And I'm like, well, what happens if I do exercise? Well, then you're going to get a hernia and then you'll be back having surgery again. I'm like, oh, I don't want that. <laughs> I didn't really like surgery. So anyways, I listened and I didn't exercise for six weeks, which was a huge drama for me. But I started going to physio for what? I have a burst appendix. Anyways, I went to physio because, you know, that's my dream team. And, and I thought I'm in, the, I'm in the surveillance of someone who's smart. <laughs> and we just did little drills. So it wasn't training, but we did, you know, I, I have bad feet. So we did single leg standing. We did some different activation exercises. So when I got back to training, my calves still worked, my feet still worked, my arms still worked. And, you know, I, um, of course, I've walked my dogs probably seven hours a day, but um, I just did things, you just find something else. You know, if you give up Diet Coke, then you better find bubbly water, because you got to replace the bubbles with something. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> so that's what I did when I couldn't exercise for six weeks. <laughs> No, no, that's awesome. I think I think it's really fantastic. And and you're, th this is something that I think is very powerful. If you do have an injury in your shoulder, then why not look at your feet? Because, you know, Eric and I really try to teach people that movement longevity really is all about your whole body. And, and it's amazing how things sneak up on us. An injury sneaks up on us. We're not even aware of it, but an imbalance evolves just because we're right handed or we do, we, we carry our purse in a certain way, or we walk the dog a certain route and, you know, use the leash in our one hand. And so these imbalances creep up on us without us even being aware. And so 
doing something daily for your body to try to rebalance, I think is, is um, a message that Eric and I really wanna try and, and get out there. And I'm curious if you've had an opportunity to use the ROM uh, running warm up and cool down and, and, you know, cause that's kind of the purpose of those programs, you know, to kind of activate the muscles, make sure the right muscles are working and then rebalance your tissues and, and just what's your experience been with them? Yeah, I've loved them. And it was interesting. I, I, I run in the morning with my dog and this is, it can be anywhere between 5 a.m. and 6 a.m. that I'm starting. So I just literally, all I want to do is like get going, but I was like, no, I'm going to do this run warm up. So the first thing for people to realize is it does not take long. It took about five minutes and it really did address everything that I needed uh, it was, it, so again, I'm just getting out of bed. Like I get out of bed, I brush my teeth and, and out I'm going to go. So I, you can't be more stiff than I am uh, in terms of <laughs> like, I, ha I haven't, I haven't even started moving yet. You know, I haven't done anything. And, um, and I actually, the, I, I woke up and my back was quite stiff and uh, I went through the pre-run warm up, and I thought, oh, you know, maybe there'll be some back work in there. And there was no specific in my brain anyway, specific back work. But it was addressed because the back pro the back stiffness was completely gone after I did the exercises. So it, it, you know what that showed me was what might look like back stiffness might actually be your hip because the hip um, uh, I'm not sure what it was called, but your whole your your bring your knee up to 90 degrees and you push in the opposite directions for the hip. So it's I think it's your rotation. Uh, that one just helped so much. And then the reaching forward. Uh, with my feet and then working on the ankle turns and getting to have the opportunity to do uh, proper stretching afterwards. I mean, it's, I think we all think, yeah, it's a good idea to stretch. And, and I think I was, uh, uh, I just sort of said to myself, which is not like me to say, well, it's all downhill from here. <laughs> you know, Don't really know what's going to happen from here. And, you know, I'm seeing, you know, my mom who's now 87, you know, having trouble with her feet, not walking well and, um, you know, in a bit of pain. And I have a sister who has a sore back and, you know, a brother who needed a, a hip replacement. My dad had four hip replacements. So I'm seeing all that. And I feel as if that was the, the dealing with that was really taking control over my mobility that that is, so anyone who's struggling with getting older, the, the way to armor up against that is to take care of your mobility because without mobility you will have a limited life <laughs> there's no question <laughs> and so in every in the decisions that I make now uh, I, I no longer am struggling with being 52 I'm taking pride in that and I'm taking pride in staying strong fighting off osteoporosis losing mobility uh, and I'm going to keep, you know, my strength, my flexibility, my mobility. If I can do that for as long as possible, then I'm not going to get old. And that's, that's the key. The bit about uh, just being such an elite athlete and runner. What do you think about in terms of running technique? Like when you go out for a run, if you're focusing on your technique, what are the things that you think about that uh, help you to run more efficiently and, and better? Yeah, for running, you, I mean, the better technique you have, the easier it will be to not get injured. So um, you want to have your hips slightly forward, your pelvis slightly tilted forward so that you're almost as if you're thinking somebody's pulling your, if you had a chest heart rate monitor strap on, as if they're pulling your chest forward. So you've got that sort of slight lean, you're running over your feet. You don't want your feet to land in front of your body. Your feet definitely go forward. But by the time they hit the ground, your body should be over top of your feet. And one of the best ways to work on that is to run hills if you're healthy. Uh, but hills, hill running technique, because if you can picture, you know, the hill, you have to lean into the hill. So you get that bit of a forward lean as you go uh, up the hill. It helps you to learn to drive your knees up because you're going up. You've got to get up the hill. And it helps with turnover because you don't take great big strides going up a hill. They're like usually little tiny short ones. So running up hills 
for someone who wants to improve their running and is healthy enough to improve their running, that is the single most, a single best way to improve your running technique. So you want to have some knee drive, quick turnover, slight lean forward, run over top of your feet rather than running into your feet because that puts the brakes on. You can imagine if you're running and putting the brakes on with every foot strike, you're now causing a huge amount of impact to your knees and, and to your back. And so you want to get that, that, that lean going forward. Uh, and if you're looking at performance, hills are also great because your heart rate goes up no matter what. So you're going to work on um, increasing your anaerobic threshold without really too much effort. The thing I love most about hills from a performance point of view is even on a day where you're tired and you don't feel like you're going to be fast, you just can't lose with a hill because you've got to get to the top. So if you're having a sluggish day and it usually takes you a minute to get to the top and it takes you a minute four, you're still going to get, get the same training effect. Your heart rate's going to go up. So you're working on threshold. You're getting strength because you're running up a hill. You're working on form because you're running up a hill. Uh, and you're working on power. <laughs> you're working on speed. So that four seconds doesn't matter. Whereas if you think about being tired and going to the track and now you're running 400s, and you're running slower, you know, four or five seconds slower per 400, that can just sit in your head and really drive you crazy. And you might think, oh, I didn't run fast enough. I didn't get those, you know, the, those, that, those muscle fibers going. And, and if you're not mentally into it, it'll probably be more than four seconds. So I love, love, love Hills. It's the single best workout you could ever do uh, to prepare to be a per for performance, but also for technique. That's awesome. I've, I've actually never heard, heard it broken down um, that way and simplified that way. I've got, uh, I got some really big hills around where I live. So I think I'll, <laughs> I'll be getting out there a little, little more often. Um, what about, um, let's think just to break it down. I'm a biomechanics geek, so I just want to know what you're thinking exactly. What about your arm swing? What are you thinking about if there's anything that you're thinking about your arm sure, swing? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the, the key running drills are A's, B's and C's they're called and they all work on those you know your good arm swing but I always think about having like a little hinge in my arm and if I put this down and then my arm is at 90 degrees and it's just as if I'm getting something out of my pocket so my okay. arm I'm not moving it up I'm not doing mm -hmm. this this is one motion and it's just going back so I'm just sort of hitting my hips and, uh, and bring it back and forth and keeping things loose. So that forward running style, do your forward like this as you're running. And, you know, that's definitely an important, uh, important tool because when your arms speed up, your legs tend to speed up. So run speed, again, for performance, if people are interested in that, it's a combination of stride length and turnover. So the two things in combination will make you faster. So if your stride is too long, if you overstride, well, that can lead to injury for sure because you've got a ton of impact. And chances are most people don't have the hip flexibility or the hip flexor range. So the range of motion through your hip flexors. So again, if I go down, I'm not sure if you can see my hip flexors like going back. If you're, if you're going to kick your hip flexors back, most people get that extension through your hip flexors using their back which is, which it would be incorrect. Now you're going to have a back problem. Your hip extension has to come from the glutes and runners are notorious for not having great firing glutes. So we don't want to have too long of a stride length because chances are we're getting it by, by over, over extending our back. And, uh, and if your stride length is too long, it typically means your turnover isn't rapid. So let's just, for example, people talk about run cadence. So often I'll get a new runner that I'm coaching and their run cadence might be 70 RPM. So that means their foot hits the ground 70 times a minute, which sounds like a lot, but that's very, very low. An elite runner is closer to 100. So much quicker turnover, but they still have stride length. <laughs> so it's not like they're running on the spot, but they just are able to do that stride quickly. So if you're running at a stride, um, a turnover of 70 and I'm running at a turnover of hundred, 
your foot's on the ground longer than mine is, which means your quads, like your muscles, like you're just more static. So think about run, think about hopping on one foot and holding a static position for a second. And that is a huge load on your ankles, your feet, your knees, your muscles. And so it's going to break you down a lot more quickly if you've got slow turnover. Things will just get more sore. Not necessarily injured, although probably over time, but they'll get more sore. If you're turning over at 100 RPM, now your foot is coming into contact with the ground and it's coming on and off, on and off really quickly. So there's less impact of the muscles, the joints. It's lighter. You're on and off. So that's often, you know, that's the ideal. Uh, I remember when we'd raced an Ironman and Peter Reed, he was like 6'5". I'm 5'4". <laughs> of course, my turnover is going to be faster than Peter's. There's just no question. Uh, he's going to run faster than me, <laughs> even no matter what. He's stronger. But his turnover was slow. His, his turnover was slower than mine. And notoriously, he would carry... Ironman fatigue longer than I would because his foot feet spent more time on the ground than mine did. Mine just came off much more quickly. Of course, I have less body weight going through it as well. Uh, so turnover is super important and then getting that proper stride length. And so again, for someone that is over striding, often it's just a matter of having them do little cadence drills within their run. So, you know, for a minute, every five minutes, just count what your cadence is and try to get it over 80. You're not going to go from 70 to 90 or 100, but gradually, if we can get the cadence moving up, then uh, your stride length is going to shorten a little bit and uh, you're going to get a little bit faster as well. Uh, of course, a, a long stride length, again, a great runner. If you look at some of the great runners, they still have a very good stride length. <laughs> it's very good. So it's that combination, but to get a good stride length, you have to have the flexibility, you have to have the strength and it has to be in the right spot. So good glute strength, good hip flexors, uh, et cetera. So lots, there's lots of great running drills for that as well. Hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks mm -hmm. for sharing. And uh, for anybody who's interested, I know Lisa, you do coaching for athletes um, and maybe you want to talk just briefly about that, but we'll put a link down in the comment after the show to your website. It's lisabentley.com. I'm sure people can find that, but maybe you could talk about the, your coaching and who you typically coach and what you do. Uh, yeah, I've coached, you know, runners and triathletes, uh, to, you know, to do races, to do Olympic distance, to do marathons, to do Ironmans and Ironman 70.3s. Uh, some people, I mean, I, I coach beginners as well. I have a woman that all she wanted to do was be able to do um, a uh, 300 meter swim, 10K bike, 2K run. That was the goal. And that is not an only, that's a great feat. Uh, but it's interesting now because now she's, you know, she's like, I never thought I could do that. Now we're goal, uh, the goal is an Olympic distance. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, just again, with the, with COVID, it's fun to have little goals. So uh, we, over the course of a week, the goal was to cycle 90 kilometers and run 21 kilometers over the course of seven days. So now she's done a half Ironman essentially, and, uh, it doesn't have to all be in one day. So it's been fun little goals like that. So I always have, I just, people love accomplishing something. So it's, it was fun for me. Like, it's amazing. So yeah, I've coached elite athletes in the past. Uh, but I really get fired up by every athlete, whether they're a beginner or they're a seasoned veteran. Uh, and, you know, of course, the, I, I love figuring out the training, making it interesting, helping them accomplish their goals. But it's way more than that. It's the mental preparation. It's the nutrition. It's having been in their shoes before, uh, which is is fun you know I know I know what they're thinking <laughs> I know how they're feeling so I'll often write in their workout that <clears throat> you know I know you're going to be really tired <laughs> but just keep going <laughs> like it, there's some workouts where you should stop but this is one where it's just finish it off you know or this is a run where you should just smell the roses like don't even think about it this is not performance orientated this is this is energy producing love life kind of workout uh, so yeah, no, I, my husband and I both coach and we, we definitely love, uh, love coaching and, 
uh, teaching people technique and, and helping them learn new things and, and set their goals. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so much fun. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, yeah, just a reminder folks, I'll, I'll post a link down uh, if you want to learn more about coaching with Lisa, I think, man, maybe I'll sign up for that. That's a, <laughs> I would love to, it sounds like fun coaching with you. Working with you. <laughs> well, now the great thing, cause everyone gets injured and, uh, and it, it's, you know, usually I've had their injury before, so it's quite fun mm. for me because I can, you know, I can help with that. Uh, but now you've made my job a lot easier because when they tell me something isn't working, <laughs> like I've got plantar fasciitis or whatever happens to be, you definitely always have a video. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, you want to watch this video and I'll watch it too. I've never had plantar fasciitis. That's like the one injury I've never had. And so I watched the hour video that you and Aaron did on plantar fasciitis. And so I learned so much. And so I wrote some notes down and sent it to my athlete and said, these are the go-to exercises. And then, and of course, now I can tell them the different mobility work they can do with the ROM coach. So you've definitely made me life, my life a lot easier. I don't have to do the videos anymore. I can't tell you the number of videos I've done of myself with different stretches and different strengthening. Now I'm like, oh, I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> Cool. Okay. Well, do you have a, a couple more minutes? We have a few questions from people here. Um, sure. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Yep. Wendy is asking Lisa, what vital signs do you record on a regular basis and why, and how do you measure them? Well, I don't record too many things. Uh, I'm 10 years removed from professional sport. Uh, I, I like heart rate. I think heart rate tells a lot. Uh, it tells if you're tired, if you can't get your heart rate up, if your heart rate's quite high, it can tell if I'm getting a bit sick or if I'm dehydrated or stressed out. So the uh, heart rate can tell me a lot about what I'm doing. Uh, so that's the one thing that I look at probably the most. I don't measure uh, heart rate variability. I, I know there's a lot of new buzzwords out there. Uh, I don't look at, you know, of course my, my watch can do a lot of things. Um, but it often tells me that I'm like maintaining and I'm thinking maintaining, like, I just rode for four hours, How is that maintaining? but I guess I usually might prefer. You maintain, but, you, you know, try to maintain on the bike for four hours, <laughs> stupid watch. I'm like, stop telling me that, but you know, it's, um, there's no particular data, but with, you know, my athletes, I, I do look at Watts on the bike, um, but I don't let anything control me. I think that's the big key. So wattage on the bike that tells me that the power that an athlete's pushing. So I'll get information from it. Uh, I'll combine their information about their watts and their bike with their heart rate. And <clears throat> then that tells me what might be optimal, doing things like threshold tests that also gives me a good idea of uh, where to set their um, watts on the bike so that we work the right energy systems, whether it be aerobic or threshold or anaerobic. Uh, so that, I guess, is some data that I use. And uh, I, I, you know, I look, I sort of look at it all, but I'm not, I don't, I don't judge it too much. I can tell if their heart rate didn't get high enough, that obviously I didn't push them hard enough because it, it might've been a work that I needed to. Uh, so, but the best feedback I can get from an athlete is how they felt. And, um, you know, how did it feel? Did it feel good? Was it a struggle? Uh, were you aching? You know, how, how did you feel all around? That's, that's probably one of the best, um, best bits of data I could ever get. Mm. That's very, you're old school. I like that. I'm very old school, <laughs> but I get all the info. Like I get this when athletes send me their information, some people send me screenshots and everything. And, um, they'll often ask, was that helpful? And it's like, yes, it's, it's never helpful in isolation. I just take it all in. Like I get mm. the big picture. It's more helpful when you see it week after week, because then you can see changes and that's what's key. So, you know, I, I, the fact that you rode at 110 Watts, great in a month when i see that you wrote at 120 watts as an average for the whole workout now i see progress so that's it's, it's always the big picture it's never one thing in isolation cool very cool okay uh, next question we have uh, from jan what were the main challenges from cystic fibrosis um getting sick a lot that was often a bit of a challenge so i typically if i get an infection uh, it's blows up for, you know, six to six to eight weeks through the course of antibiotics and then getting better. Uh, so that was always the challenge. Uh, I, I didn't stop run a training, but my training was dictated by how I felt. 
So that's probably how I learned to do the best I could with my deck of cards. Uh, the CF clinic would never say don't go for a run or a bike or a swim uh, because that helps to you know, open up the lungs and get rid of mucus, which is the biggest key to getting healthy. Uh, but of course, they don't want me to dig a hole. So there was always that moderation. But, you know, honestly, my body would be held back by having an infection. So certainly illness was one part of it. Uh, the other part was the side effects from antibiotics. So one of the antibiotics I had to take was called ciprofloxin. And that has been documented to cause Achilles tendon rupture. And I'm sure it's not just the Achilles tendon, but because that's the major tendon, uh, that's the one that's documented. So uh, I've had Achilles surgery and I've had Achilles problems. And, uh, and you know, now I've got this other tendon. So I'm, I'm sure that the ciprofloxin, uh, which I would take probably three times a year, contributed to the degeneration in some regard of my tendons. So that wasn't great. Uh, and the other bit of a roadblock was the sodium loss. So you're diagnosed with cystic fibrosis because you have a higher concentration of sodium in your sweat. So now picture that I race in Hawaii where there's a high degree of sweat. So therefore I had a high degree of sodium loss. And it's re really impossible to replace all that sodium. And the result of sweating out too much sodium is that your muscle muscles cramp. And so it was something I had to learn how to deal with and learn how to manage, which isn't easy because no one's pricking my finger every mile to tell me, take another salt pill, take another this, do this. So it was something I had to learn. I had to climatize. So I would often go to Hawaii four weeks before the race so that I could be the best sweater possible as possible the better you sweat the less sodium you'll sweat so I did that uh, I took salt pills while I raced and I finally figured out the combination that would bring me the best success it was never perfect I always had some sort of a a side effect if you take too much sodium there's a side effect if you don't take enough there's a side effect so I, I never got it perfect but that's okay that's why you keep trying uh, so those were the the, the big parts for sure uh, for me with, with CF, I mean, since I've retired, of course, I've had some complications. I've had to be on intravenous for five weeks. I've had a collapsed lung. Uh, the first appendix was somewhat related to CF. It's a bit more prevalent in people with CF to get a ruptured appendix. Uh, so, you know, some of those things, but, you know, that's who I am. And uh, the CF has brought me more blessings than curses. So I'll just keep on taking it in and, and being as healthy as I can be. Awesome. That's uh, yeah. Just sit reading again, going back to your book, um, reading the stories that you share there uh, where you get into, you really vividly illustrate what it's like to, to be dealing with some of the things you were dealing with and training for Ironman's um, was <laughs> It's just mind blowing to me, really. Um, so again, people, you, you really have to get this book, An Unlikely, an unlikely Champion. Um, so uh, I think we've got time for one more question. I don't want to keep you too long because I know you're a, you're a busy person. Um, but this one is kind of re very related to what you just said in terms of Achilles tendonitis. Uh, this is a 50-year-old male um, with an Achilles issue, rested it for a long time, started walking, but it's not 100%. Do you have to be 100% Achilles tendonitis free, I guess, or fixed before running 5K daily? And I'll direct this to you, Lisa, and then Doc, you can jump in after that. Yeah, the experts to the doctor, because she worked on my Achilles. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think you have to know your body. The first thing I'd say is you have to be 100% healthy to run every day. And I do not recommend running every day. So the, the best thing you can do is ad adapt in every other day. And if you have Achilles tendon issues, then really what you're trying to do is manage your Achilles. And the running is a reward for managing your Achilles. So if you can, if you can run pain-free, then you can, you know, you can run and then give it a day, like a, a whole day to rebound. I mean, the wonderful thing about the Achilles is that if you're doing your eccentric loading and different things is it actually responds to that and it gets better. So assuming that you've done the process, like you've gone with a physiotherapist, you've done the eccentric loading, you've gone through 
um, you know, the exercise plan to get as strong as possible. And you are continuing to get better every day, you're not going down the rabbit hole, you're going up the rabbit hole, then, then, you know, you can, you know, perhaps run, but this first sign of things getting, you know, to Wednesday was worse than Tuesday. Well, then you've got to go back to point zero, but you know, the, your first run, I would not advise it to be 5k. I think there's great success with walk run, especially with tendons. Uh, because the walk part of it almost lets it like you stretch it, you stretch it, you stretch it. We walk and everything kind of goes, Oh, happy time. I can like recover a little bit. And then you stress it and go back to running again. And then you walk again and it kind of recuperates a little bit. So I would suggest as your first run back is, you know, a run walk program of, you know, a minute walk, a minute run, 30 second walk. Uh, and, and you do that for 10 minutes. Uh, when I came back from Achilles uh, surgery, I started with a walk run program and, and no, it wasn't pain-free the first time, but two days later, when I tried again, it was pain-free as you gradually stress it out, but definitely stop, start with a walk run. I suggest never resuming running every day <laughs> ever. Uh, and until, you know, in five years when you're perfect, absolutely perfect and you don't even remember the word Achilles then maybe uh, but until then uh, I, I wouldn't recommend that at all but over to Erin because she is really the expert. Well, um, well thanks Lisa and actually I love what you said there um, I agree that you know if you're in pain <clears throat> excuse me you shouldn't be overloading your Achilles um, you need to look at the root cause as to why your Achilles has become a problem in the first place so doing the mo mobility exercises for your foot uh, activating the correct muscles in your lower limb are critical and uh, but one thing that I really liked that Lisa said was the walk run and she's what she's really describing is um, adaptation to of the tendon. So you have to load a tendon in order for it to heal and for it to recover. And the key though, is to not overload the tendon. So if you overload the tendon, then you go backwards, you go down the rabbit hole uh, and you create more inflammation and injury. But by um, loading it a little bit, then you stimulate the cells in the tendon to heal and to become stronger. And it teaches the cells how to line up properly in the tendon instead of just kind of putting re repair material out every side of the cell, it will line up along the lines of stress. So the, um, how do you know how much you do? You know by how you're feeling. So listen to your body and um, how you feel the day after. If you're stiff the next day, you don't run the next day. And if you're stiff the day after that, you don't run the next day. But if you're feeling good the next after after the day off, then you can go do the walk run routine again. I, I really like that way of progressively loading the tendon, letting the tendon adapt uh, and get stronger. Because the first really the first principle is to establish your foundation for movement. And then you build endurance, strength, power, speed. And if you jump up the pyramid too quickly, even you know when you're feeling pretty good and you start doing hills and working on power and speed, you're going to go. You're you're going to lose your your foundation very quickly. So, um, some but not too much. Enough but not too much. <laughs> the great balancer, um, and hills are terrible for an Achilles. <laughs> so don't run yeah. Hills. <laughs> not not yet, not yet. But you know, like ever since I had Achilles problems. And, Air, you know, Erin was right there. She got me through Achilles problems. Um, I never ran two days in a row again. So that was someone that used to run two times a day. I used to complete seven runs a week. Uh, and after, you know, getting my Achilles healthy, my Achilles is healthy. I'm, like I have two beautiful Achilles tendons. I've never ran every day again because it's okay. Like I want to run forever, right? This is about longevity and staying healthy. And I just remember the pain I would have with my Achilles and getting up from my desk and not being sure if when I put my foot down, if it would hurt or not. That's an, an awful way to live. Like it's a really awful way to live. So if you get back to running and you're doing your walk run and the next day you get up from your desk and you're wondering if you can put one foot in front of the other, then that's a good sign to say, okay, I'm going to, you know, I'll run it in two more days. Like, let me give it a bit more time. 
and, and take that time. Uh, and, and don't even call it a run. Like sometimes I'll have an athlete come back from injury and I'll say, we're going to start with a walk run, but I want you to dress in your winter coat. The only difference is put on a pair of running shoes. And when you go out, go out for a 30 minute um, walk and one minute every five, go for a jog. And so this is not a run because as soon as we call something a run, we have expectation. The watch gets started. The data gets collected. No, 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 no. This is a walk and you get to treat yourself to a run every five minutes because we're not ready to run yet. <laughs> and so let's just um, not even call it that. I'll, I'll, you can ride your bike for five hours, but we're not going to run yet. So yeah, you distract yourself with something else. <laughs> That's an awesome message, Lisa. So folks, I would love to talk with Lisa all day if I could, but uh, I think it's time to to wrap it up here. And I, I actually changed, I think that message you just left with left off with there is, is so important. Um, I changed the title to this session, our, our session here to run forever um, because I, I think that's kind of our message. It's movement longevity. And then just, you know, running a marathon to me is running, running 10 K is almost running forever for me, but running a marathon and you're doing them in under three hours. Like, um, and what you're, you're still doing now, the mindset that you bring, uh, that can help people to run forever, or ride forever, or exercise forever, play sport forever, whatever it is. Uh, so thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. I learned a ton and I'll be taking away a, a lot from the, the messages that you share. And uh, we'd love to have you again here one day. Awesome. One day soon. I love it too. <laughs> Thank Thanks you. so much, Lisa. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Okay, everybody. So we'll be back next week, Thursday at noon. Uh, we'll get to more questions then. And we hope to see you there. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, we are offline.